Hi there, my name's Patrick Denny and welcome to this video presentation on Roman Colchester. Um, you'll see the, the title is More Discoveries from Roman Colchester because this is really the second um, talk in the series. The first um, talk was the Roman Conquest and Boudicca's Revenge and in this talk we're going to be looking at some of the amazing discoveries which have been found in Roman Colchester over the last few decades. So if we move on now to our first slide and here we're looking at a, a reconstruction of Roman Colchester. Um, here we've got the Temple of Claudius. This is where Colchester Castle stands today and it stood within a large precinct which you can see here. The, the modern day high street would run along somewhere along here in front of the temple and go down what is now East Hill somewhere here. But you know, most large Roman towns, apart from having um, a temple, they had lots of other public buildings, they would have bathhouses, but they would have also had a theatre. And if you look at the, in the foreground of this picture, here we've got the theatre standing right next to the Temple of Claudius. The theatres, of course, were shaped in like a, like a letter D, like a half circle as opposed to the amphitheatres which were more rounded or oval and in the theatres is where they would stage plays, drama, um, pantomime, festivals and so on whereas in the amphitheatres is where you would have the gladiatorial contests, the animal fighting you know and various other games but um, this is a theatre and this would have seated about 3,000 spectators so it's quite large. I mean, if you compare it with our modern theatre, the Mercury in Colchester, which we think is quite a reasonable provincial theatre, only seated about 500. And, and also, as, we, as we're discussing this today, only five Roman theatres have actually been uncovered in Britain. And two of those are in Colchester. This one and the other one, which is a large one, which was seated over 5,000, was at Gosbeck's which is just to the west of Colchester um, towards if you were going to Colchester Zoo and there was another one at St Albans, uh, one at Canterbury and one at Faversham in Kent. But anyway so this was um, this um, where this is located this correspond this road here corresponds to modern-day Maidenborough Street and St Helens Lane would run along here and if we look at the modern scene so here we've got Maidenborough Street coming down and St Helens Lane and right on the corner of those two streets, right on the corner of where the Roman theatre would be, we have St Helens Chapel. Now St Helens Chapel's got quite an interesting story in itself because according to the old borough archives and records, um, this was founded by Eudo and there he is, Eudo Dapifer was a steward to William the Conqueror at the time of the Norman Conquest and not only did he build Colchester Castle, or finished off building it at least, according to the Chronicle, um, he also restored St Helens Chapel in 1076. So the original chapel was probably a timber frame building, which may have started off as a Saxon chapel or church, maybe in the 7th or 8th century, something like that. The Chronicle also mentions not only was it restored by Udo in 1076 but it was originally built by St Helena herself and St Helena is the patron saint of Colchester and this is her statue sitting on top of the town hall she's holding a cross in her right hand and she's facing towards Jerusalem. The story of St Helena is mixed very much with legend fact and fable all interwoven. The story goes that she was born in Colchester, the daughter of old King Cole. She married a Roman general called Constantius. They had a son called Constantine who became Emperor of Rome, who the story says was also born in Colchester. Now we know a lot of that is not true, but there are some truthful elements. If you, if you was to walk down Maidenborough Street and if you didn't know that this was the site of a Roman theatre. If you look along the corner here, um, at the bottom there, you can clearly see Roman foundations, Roman brickwork. So certainly this building had an early origin. Now, what you can see here is Roman brick or tile 
with septaria stone and it's very similar to what you've got in the construction of the castle built by Udo. Now the castle of course although it's Norman it was built using recycled um, Roman materials. So could this be material from when this was rebuilt in 1076 or could these foundations actually be of Roman origin themselves? Anyway in the 1980s 1984 they uncovered the street surface of Maidenborough Street. This was all in connection with um, a lot of these Victorian cottages on the right here were being renovated and when they uncovered the street they they found the foundations of the Roman theatre and they could clearly see it curving into where these buildings are and interestingly these foundations were only about um, a foot or so below the modern street surface whereas usually in Colchester in other parts of the town when you get down to the Roman levels they are six seven eight feet down but you know because this theatre was next to the temple and later the castle the castle was owned by the crown and you know people wouldn't have been allowed to build anywhere near it so that's probably why these foundations are still fairly fairly close to the surface in the bottom picture when they relayed the street with these red bricks what they put over the overlying the found theater foundations they put black bricks so if you walk down there now you can actually see where you're walking and this bit here is the stage coming along from the right and then it starts to go up here the auditorium curving round into these buildings here and um, this is the Roman theatre building in Maidenborough Street and um, rather than having they've got accommodation up here they turn that into a flat or something and although they originally were going to have a flat on the ground floor thankfully when they found these foundations they decided to leave them exposed so people can have a look um, you can look through these windows here to see what's going on or if you go with a, on a guided tour or at some other stage when it's open for a special occasion you can go and have a look inside on the little plan at the top here this blue area here is St Helens Chapel and this heavy dark line is where they have actually uncovered and seen the foundations of the theatre but they've uncovered enough of this curve here to work out the full trajectory of the auditorium and it fits snugly in between where we know there were two Roman streets. In the bottom picture here you can see probably where in Victorian times builders cut through the foundations when they're laying drains um, for their houses. If we go inside the Roman theatre there's a little walkway, a little viewing area running all the way around where you can have a look. Um, these are the foundations here you can see the curving wall of the auditorium coming along here and um, on the far wall is a large picture painting showing what the theatre would have looked like originally. If I just blow that up a little bit you can see that around the outside there's an arcade, there's a double arcade actually of Roman arches running all the way around and when you attended the theatre you would enter through one of these ground floor arches and then you would walk around inside to find your seating area. In much the same way if you go into a modern football stadium you you go in and you walk around the concourse inside um, to get to where you want to go. Well if you look at this foundation here on the right here the the outer arcade of arches would have stood on here so they would have gone through here into this area this is the internal walkway or the concourse that which would have gone all the way around taking you to your seating area and this part over here is where the inner wall would have been built on. Um, a year or so ago my wife and I went down to the south of France and we went to Arles and we, we saw the amphitheatre there actually but it reminded me of what the theatre in Colchester would have looked like with this double arcade these arches so you can imagine the crowds pouring into one of these arches here and when you come through then you walk round, find your steps or the entrance to where you are going to be seated. Now although the theatre that we've just spoken about um, seated about 3,000 people which was you know quite good of course if you if you go 
through Italy, Turkey or France or other places, you'll find much larger theatres abroad. And this is the theatre at Ephesus, which some of you may have been to. And uh, this would have seated about 25,000 spectators. And of course, the Colosseum in Rome, giant amphitheatre, seated well over 50,000. But I just wanted to draw your attention to a man called Vitruvius, Marcus Vitruvius. Marcus Vitruvius was a, a first century Roman, first century BC, Roman author, um, architect, engineer, and he laid out detailed instructions in his treatise on architecture, which was later published as the 10 books of architecture, on how to build theatres, how to build temples, how to build Roman houses and all sorts of other Roman buildings. And um, Vitruvius's works were the, the only ancient writings on architecture that survived through translation, through the Roman times, right through to the Middle Ages and to the time of the Italian Renaissance in the early 15th century, when, you know, the rebirth of classical culture was underway, particularly classical architecture. And although at the time they still had Roman ruins, um, you know, from Roman times that they could have a look at and see how they were built, they also had the writings of Vitruvius. So he very respected Vitruvius. Um, and in his book, in the section dealing with how to build a theatre, what he, apart from giving the details of how to design it, he also says words to the effect that try and put it on a north facing slope. You know, in the Mediterranean, what you wouldn't want is your theatre facing south. So in the middle of the hot sun in the afternoon, the sun is shining in the eyes of the audience. You put it on a north facing aspect, so everything is much better. Now, the theatre in Colchester is actually on a north facing slope. Is that by design or coincidence? You know, the, although we're not in the Mediterranean, the people who built the theatre in Colchester were probably Romans, Italians. They had been schooled by Vitruvius. And you can almost imagine them hunting, they could have put it anywhere. You can imagine them hunting around for a site on a north facing slope and they found one and they put the theatre there. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Whether that was done by that. Finally, on theatres, um, yeah, we, my wife and I went to Ephesus several years ago and I took these, this picture. This is, um, this is my wife standing here. There's the seating. I've always been interested in the acoustics of these Roman theatres because I can understand fully how people in the, the front rows, etc., can hear what's going on. But what about people sitting right at the top here or right at the back? And I remember saying to my wife, look, you stay here. I'm going to run all the way up the top here. And when I get to the top, I'll wave my arm and I want you to speak to me. I'll just see if I can hear you. So I went to the top. This picture was taking looking down. My wife's right down the bottom here somewhere. And I put my arm up and she started speaking. And I could hear her really clearly. And I remember going all the way down. And when I got to the bottom, she says, well, could you hear me? I said, I could hear you. Great. Yeah, I could really hear you. And she says something like, well, why can't you hear me when you're at home in the other room? I'm trying to get your attention. Um, I think I shot myself in the foot a bit there. But anyway, let's move on. I want to talk now about Roman burials. Now, what we're looking at now is the remains of a fourth century Roman Christian church. There is a question mark at the end there because we are almost convinced it's a church, but it could have been used for some pagan purposes but probably a church and it's sited right next to what we still call the new police station in Colchester at the bottom of Butt Road. Now beyond that you can see a car running along here this is the the south way a little dual carriageway that runs between this and the town the main town within the Roman wall which is behind these buildings over here. Now according to Roman law Romans were not allowed to bury their dead within the confines of Roman towns or cities, apart from very young children, infants and children a few months old. You know, the Romans didn't view very young children as though they were complete persons. Um, they didn't have a, a soul according to the, that they could, could leave the body. They didn't need to be mourned. So you often find that very young babies and children were simply just buried in a pit 
or in a rubbish pit or sometimes they might be buried in the garden the same way you might bury a family pet or something but certainly for older people and most um, Romans they although they were not allowed to bury their dead in the Roman towns they didn't want them to be too far away so you often find the Roman cemeteries are either side of the main approach roads into Roman towns they often call this the avenue of tombs or in the case of Pompeii the street of tombs so as you approach the main gateway either side of the road you've got all the cemeteries and all the big tombs um, facing you again when my wife and I a few years ago were in in Turkey again at Hierapolis which is an ancient Roman city before we could get to the Roman the main gateway into the historic city we had to walk through this giant necropolis like a, a, a giant ancient cemetery and there were large tombs almost some like little houses facing you as you went through and of course in Colchester what we now call Lexton Road would would be our street of tombs or our avenue of tombs and yes they have found several large cemeteries um, lining that road over the years but back to this Butt Road Cemetery, this, um, they uncovered this church which stood on the edge of a large cemetery. The archaeologists, the Colchester Archaeological Trust, who excavated this um, in 1988, actually won a national award um, for this particular site. It's reckoned to be the oldest surviving Roman Christian church in Britain. Um, and it's it's on display um you might think well hang on a minute there's not much on display but th but there is something there so it's the oldest christian church on display in britain and um i said it stands on the side of a large cemetery it would have looked something like this um quite a small building mainly a single cell building with a little apsidal end on one on the eastern end which may have been added later inside would have been quite dark in fact when they did the excavation work inside the church area itself they found five complete roman oil lamps so that may they may well have been used in there to provide lighting and the church itself you can see here stood on the edge of this large cemetery here um, just to show you where we are again this is the roman wall coming along balkan lane there it runs along there's the head gate this is where the Deal carriageway runs along here now and um, and this is Butt Road and the police station you saw would be somewhere here and when they when this excavation it, it took place over a number of years but culminating in the late 1980s and when it was finally finished it it made the 10 o'clock news um, on television and it was quite exciting because when the archaeologists started digging down in this cemetery they started uncovering burials lots of these burials and all of these burials were aligned in an east-west orientation which is the christian traditional way of laying out the dead but when the archaeologists dug deeper they found an earlier cemetery underlying the christian one at the top and in the earlier underlying cemetery most of the burials were aligned in a north-south orientation which was the pagan way of doing things and this cemetery dates from about 320 to about 340 something like that and of course you may know that in 313 there was something called the Edict of Milan where the Emperor Constantine um, who had now been converted into a Christ Christian um, made Christianity um, a religion that could be practiced without persecution so it was tolerated throughout the Roman Empire and later in the fourth century it ended up becoming the state religion of Rome so even in the way they're burying the dead you can see how the pagan way had changed over to the Christian way um, if we look at this um, little plan I've put here this is the plan of the cemetery you'll see that most of it this large area here had been destroyed in the Victorian period in the 1840s when they were extracting sand and gravel from the site so all of those have really been lost although about 200 of them were recorded at the time by a man called William Wire who was an amateur archaeologist but um, in the latest like it was mainly on this side 
where the burials were that were excavated. And the archaeologists were able to excavate well over 700 of these skeletons. And um, it's quite amazing because once they were examined by experts, you could they could obviously tell whether these were male or female. They could tell how tall they were. Um, in many cases, they could tell what illnesses or injuries they'd sustained in life that they'd, they'd healed. They could sometimes tell what killed them, how they died. And interestingly, in many cases, they could also put them into family groups. Although they may not have been buried right next to each other, they, they reckon they could put them into family groups because of the way anomalies within the skeleton. You know, as an example, although we've all got a collarbone, for example, um, they might be slightly different in some people than others. And it might be a, a genetic thing that runs in families. So by this sort of method, they were able to look at the skeletons and put them in family groups. It's interesting that modern pathologists would struggle to do this because they never get to see 700 burials all at once. So having all these skeletons in front of them, they were able to do uh, amazing things. I'm just going to share with you one or two examples of what was found. This was the grave of a young female, about seven years old, estimated. And when she was died, um, obviously her hair must have been tied up and pinned, these two alloy copper pins here, holding her hair in place. It's only a small thing, but it all adds to the picture of what was happening at the time. Um, here we've got an adult female who may well have been buried with her boots on. Here you can see hobnails, rusted hobnails from a pair of boots or shoes. The leather work has long gone. Whether the, they were on her feet or whether they were just put next to her body is not known. Um, sometimes they find jewellery, in this case um, a finger ring in situ of this middle-aged male. And this is an interesting, um, they found about six of these and these were all found within the confines of the church itself. And I, in the past, when I've, if I'm talking to a live audience, we usually have a little, little bit of a question answer session here and ask people what they think it is. And sometimes people will come up with um, things like, could it be a toilet? Um, is it a grave? Is it a little well or what have you? And at this stage, I, I normally say, well, look, when I got married back in the 70s, um, I made about 40 of these. And I usually say, I, I reckon there's people in the audience have also made some in the past. And by this time, they probably twig on that it's a post hole. So there would have been a timber post here, which is rotted away, and you're left with the hole and all these bricks. Now, if you're putting a post in today, you can buy a big metal holder that you put in the ground with a spike on which you put the the post in but back in the 70s you didn't have those and what you would do you would you would just dig a, a big hole in the ground if you didn't use concrete you'd just dig a big hole stand your post in hold it nice and upright and then backfill the soil now if you just backfill the soil and rammed it down as try as you best when you would still be able to move the post about so what you used to do, as you were backfilling, you would get some old rubble, some old broken bricks and things like this, and you would ram them down all the way around the post as you're backfilling the earth in. And by doing that, when you'd filled it up, it was really solid. And that's what they were doing here um, in Roman times. And the, the final burial to show you, this is a, um, a double burial they found. It's a male and female. And um, the... The one on the left, it, it, the one on the left skull looks like it's sort of looking towards this one. This one seems to be talking. It's it, just the way I'm sort of thinking here. And although this is a shorter skeleton, this is actually the male and that is the female. Anyway, they took the skull of the female and sent it off to Professor Richard Neves' forensic team, which was then based in Manchester University. And um, this was the team that used to do a lot of work with Scotland Yard doing these facial reconstructions. But anyway, here he is, Richard Neve, working on the skull of the female found in the Butt Road Cemetery. In, in later years, of course, Richard Neve has also been working on some of the burials in Pompeii. And um, here he is with a, a Pompeii man 
there was a documentary on television which some of you may have seen but anyway about a year or so later he finally finished working on the colchester female and here she is um she's she's been given the name camilla probably after camuladunum the name that colchester used to be called by but you know this could be any modern day woman walking around the town today who walked around colchester during the early part of the fourth century and if you want to find out more you can pop into colchester castle museum go up onto the first floor and there's a, a, a display dedicated to the butt road graveyard there's camilla and lots of other finds and information that you can have a look at still on the burial theme this um, headline flashed around the world in 1996. This was at Stanway. So this is to the west of Colchester, where it says here, frozen in time, archaeologists find 2000 year old board game ready to play. This was really exciting. And um, I'll talk more about that in a moment. But let me tell you about the site. They're called the Stanway enclosures and um, they were first identified via aerial photography in the 1930s and you can see here there's five large enclosures and there they are shown on this little plan here and it later transpired that these were burial enclosures so there's lots of burials in here these are sort of um, Romano British late British about the time of the Roman conquest that sort of period just before um, or just after and um, as time went on, um, these were all, many of these were excavated and they found these various graves and uh, it's a fascinating subject to read up on, which you may want to do later, but the so-called game grave is the one that I'm going to speak about in a moment here. Now the, the complete site where these were was owned by a firm called Tarmac and from about the 1960s they started extracting sand and gravel along the site. And by the 1980s, um, they had got near to where these enclosures were. So in 1986, the archaeologists were allowed to go and do some investigation work ahead of the sand and gravel extraction. And this process went on, on and off until it fizzled out about 2003. Now, here we've got the excavation site in the summer of 1996 and this was the time when for the first time really they were allowing members of the public to go on these sites and actually stand and watch the archaeologists uncovering a little glass jar or vase or something like that whereas in the past the archaeologists did all the work took the stuff away cleaned it up and then you might get to see it in some other context so this was an almost like time team they were getting the public very much involved. You could go on guided tours. But in this tented area here is where they found this so-called gaming board um, grave. Now it's also, although they found a, a gaming board, they also found a set of surgical instruments, believe it or not. So this is also known as the doctor's grave. So this was, um, he might have been an early Roman, he might have been a, a, a Briton, he could have been a druid, but he was certainly a doctor or a healer of some sorts. And just talking, um, first of all, on the left hand side, this is looking down into the grave. So don't forget, this is a pre-Christian grave where you have lots of grave goods. And um, in the, the size of the grave, it, it, having taken the topsoil off, it was about two, two foot six deep. Um, in old measurements, about four foot by about three foot in diameter. And, um, and in one corner, propped up in the corner here, is an amphora jar that m may have had wine in or maybe fish oils or something like that. And you might think that the archaeologist has propped this up in the corner to, to get out of the way so he can get to the other stuff, but he hasn't touched it. That is exactly as it was laid in the grave when this person was, in this case, cremated at his funeral service. So what you've got here is what we could loosely call a, a dinner service so the relatives of the deceased once his cremated remains were put in the ground they probably cooked him his favorite meal and laid it all out in the grave for him 
gave him something to drink as well because they believed of course that he was going to go into the afterlife and of course he would need something to eat and drink and also over to this side just to the right hand side of the amphora would have been a large wooden box now that wooden box is completely rotted away and disintegrated but inside that wooden box were among other things his cremated remains um, the surgical instruments and also this board game believed to be a roman board game which was put in and then right at the end the, the box would have been closed now the interesting thing about this roman board game although they have found board games in the past and roman game encounters in numerous graves this particular board game had been opened up think of like a monopoly board it had metal corners hinged in the middle so you could open it up and whoever had put it in the grave they'd they'd put it in the box they'd laid it out they'd lined up all the counters on both sides and they had started the game and they'd left it so that when this person gets into the new world he can continue with his move so the person who did this must have known how to play the game now nowhere in ancient literature has anyone found any instructions on how to play roman board games so game enthusiasts of course were really keen on this to see if they could work out how this game perhaps was being played on the right hand side this is lisa happy she was the archaeologist who was uncovering it and although the board game was disintegrated you can just about see the metal corner of the board game here there and there you can see some of the white opaque glass counters and blue counters on this side this white material here is the cremated remains of the individual and some of these other implements are the surgical instruments which were found and there's um, a larger view of what she saw later on this was completely uh, there was a reconstruction made which is in the castle museum in colchester now um, showing you how exactly where everything was found this implement at the top here is very much like we might call a modern colander um, for straining things it's, it's almost like a giant kettle with no lid but if this man was a doctor or a healer maybe he was using herbs and plants to um, to filter down via this and there's the gaming board and you can clearly see how these counters have been advanced in various places somebody has started the game like you might start a chess game you pawn one pawn two go and, and then at a certain stage he stopped the game left it closed the lid ready for that person to continue the game and over the centuries the wooden box has decayed the wooden board has slowly turned to dust but these counters just remained in their place and settled in the soil until they were discovered in 1996 the surgical instruments themselves uh, many of them were of iron some of bronze but um, there they are these were later sent off to cambridge where they were x-rayed and the result was that modern day surgeons can still identify what most of these surgical instruments are actually used for today um, this for example is a little saw a little saw for sawing pieces of bone our final um, discovery I want to share with you um, this was the headlines in January 1905 when a Roman chariot racing track had been discovered in Colchester the only certain one that's been discovered in Britain and only one of a handful in the Northern Roman Empire and um, this is a uh, our plan of Colchester again we'll just have a look at so at the top here um, there's Roman Colchester this is the Temple of Claudius this is the theatre that we spoke about earlier and this is the main gateway into the town the butt road cemetery would be here somewhere just about here and now of course just to the south of the town we have the circus the roman racetrack and if we just talk just briefly about the design of these racetracks they were they were long elongated structures at one one end would be squared off and this is where the the starting gates where they started the race would be located normally um, usually there would be 12 starting gates and then in the center 
there would be a barrier which is called a spina and there'd be a turning post here and a turning post here where they would race round in an anti-clockwise direction and at the end there'd be a semicircular end up here and what would happen when the race started they would all come out of the starting gates and they would have to keep in their lanes until they got to this first turning post and when they got there they could then move lanes um, jockey for position and they would then race around this central barrier seven laps and as they're going round each lap in the center barrier there'd be these large dolphins normally which would drop down as each lap like lap counters if you like but this would be the equivalent of like a two and a half mile horse race if you like and um, anyway um, in about 2000 the year 2000 and again in about 2002 during the big redevelopment of the Colchester garrison the old army barracks into housing the archaeologists um, found lots found a few of these foundations large roman foundations which they didn't really know what they were they found one somewhere around here one about here another one up here somewhere and the interesting thing these foundations although they didn't know what they they were large and they were of an unusual shape um, one end was sort of much wider than the other end if you like and they were of green sand um, like a kentish ragstone all of them so it seems they all belonged to some sort of building but they didn't know what it was many of the buildings in colchester are of septaria stone so this is quite different but anyway they they found some foundations here they also found some over here but the ones they found on the other side were like a mirror image of the other ones so the large although on the south side this large part of the foundation was to the south on the north the large part was in the opposite direction now since then of course we found out that these were buttresses um, and eventually they they found another one about 350 yards up here they lined them up and they were dead in the same line the same building material it had to be the same building but what was it could it have been a large roman wall well eventually the penny dropped and they discovered that there was a circus but what they didn't know is they hadn't found the starting gates and they hadn't found the curved semicircle at the other end but anyway that was enough to have an open day and in the 23rd of January 2005 over the weekend they invited all over two and a half thousand culture people queued up to have a look at these um, foundations this was also when time team you can see one of their gentlemen here came along to start filming what was going to be a special time team program which aired later in the year which some of you may have seen and on the day here we've got a foundation so this is this is Philip Crummy he's the director of Colchester Archaeological Trust and there's Philip talking to a little group of people here trying to explain what they've found so this is where they if you look at the bottom one this is where they found one of those foundations so they decided to follow the trench along so they followed it along here expecting to find a hard right turn for the starting gates but what they found was it started to curve round. You can see it curving round here with a slow curve. So that led them to think that maybe the starting gates in this case were at the other end, and this must be a semicircle. Now the discovery of this circus had so many twists and turns over that it took several years to actually finalize what was happening here. So with the help of time team, they dug a few more trenches here, expecting to find part of this semicircle. But they didn't find it so they thought well where is it so eventually they started putting some trenches nearer here and they found it so rather than being a slow semicircle there was a little slight circle and then it went straight across so the starting gates were here in the first place and in this revised plan which you can see at the top here this is what fall that's where philip crummy was standing there this is where they started to curve round and where they expected it to go round into a semicircle when it turned sharp right 
and went across to the starting gates. Now, since that time, they have discovered that there were not 12 starting gates here. There were only eight in Colchester. So there was eight starting gates, but the complete circus was about 450 metres in length. That's just over a quarter of a mile, which is one of the longest circuses anywhere. But it was quite narrow. It was just about 75 metres in width. But that would still have meant that probably up to 15,000 spectators um, could have turned up here. And in this illustration below, you can see the finished circus and you can see all these buttresses look. Because when you imagine this seating area, there's the, the inner wall of the grandstand, there's the outer wall, and there's lots of packed earth in between, plus all the seating, plus all the people, there would have been a lot of thrust, outward thrust. So in order to stop the wall collapsing, you had to have all these buttresses. And that's what they saw in these foundations. In this top view here, you can see an overlay of the theatre over the modern street plan. So this is Napier Road, um, and this is where it comes round into Circular Road. Um, there's the starting gates that they've discovered, and there's the east turning point, which you can just see part of here. And what they've tried to do, as the builders have been completing the site, they have been laying different colour pathways over, or putting banks in so people can actually see pedestrians where the circus was. In the lower picture, um, this is where the grandstand came across the road, just here on the top picture, came across the road. You can see these big buttresses foundations look here. So this is the outer wall of the grandstand. And in the modern footpath, you can see they've marked by putting the bricks in a different alignment where you can follow it across the road if, if, if you know what you're looking for and over the other side of the road you can even see the tarmac changes here where the grandstand crosses the road and there the grandstand this is the curved end goes right round the back and you can see it here curving right round the back so they're trying their best to lay it out so people can actually get some kind of idea of how it looked um, I just want to share with you this Google map. This is an old, fairly older Google map, but um, this is um, an overlay of the circus on the street scene, on the scene below here. And if you look here, look, I put two heavy black lines just crossing this sports field. You can see them here, look. See those there? Now, if you look at a, an older Google map, you can, before we actually knew the circus was there, you can see the grandstand, look. Can you see it running through the grass? It's, it's obviously been there all the time, but no one really knew what they were looking for. And this is a modern, this is a, a latest Google Maps from 2020, where you can clearly see how they have um, highlighted the semicircle at the far end and the starting gates can just be seen here as well. Um, these are the the replica starting gates, the, the originals are underground, but if you go on a visit to Roman Circus House, when it's open, you'll be able to go and have a look at these starting gates. This is where the race started. They've got um, a replica here of the grandstand. So you can see how people were seated. And below here, they've got one of the outer foundations of the grandstand and one of the inner foundations, which you can actually look through and have a look at. And this is, um, this is where we're going to finish this little presentation but this is this is you can imagine the excitement here the race is just about to begin they're off and they're off on the track and they would probably have had about up to 24 races in one day this was a major spectator sport in roman times and uh, another great discovery for roman colchester um, this is where i said we're going to finish this presentation um, we will be having some more um, so keep your eyes open. But just to finish off, if you're interested in learning more, um, I can certainly recommend City of Victory by Philip Crummy. Although it's a few years old now, it's, it's one of the best books on Roman culture you can get. Along with various issues of the Colchester archaeologist, which many of which are available from Roman Circus House itself, or you can find many of them online. So I hope that's been of some interest to you. And thanks for listening. Thanks.